Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today's Buying a Home in the Netherlands webinar. Um, before we get started, as you see on the screen, today's session will be recorded, um, not just the recording of my face and what I say, but also the um, PowerPoint slides. We'll share everything most likely tomorrow, um, and otherwise um, somewhere in the weekend. Let's get started. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Ludo. I am an expert buying manager. Um, I am mostly focused on the greater Amsterdam area. So Amsterdam, but also Zaandam, Amstelveen, Haarlem, Almere, everything that is in the proximity of Amsterdam. Um, I'm from the Netherlands. I'm born and raised. I have lived in the US for a couple of years. Um, you could say as an expat and then came back to the Netherlands to pursue my career here. I am a proud father of two cats. <laughs> if you guys are lucky, they might show up on the screen today. Um, they like to steal the spotlight. Um, I live in a new build in Amsterdam. I used to live in the east part of Amsterdam and then moved to the city center, the old part, and now um, decided to move to a new build in the north part of Amsterdam. I'm very happy about that, to be honest. Um, I'm not here by myself today. I am here uh, joined by one of my colleagues on the top left, that's Giovanna. And Giovanna will be here in the webinar to answer um, any questions that you guys might have during the webinar. So um, if anything pops up or you have a question about something that is mentioned, just uh, pop it in the Q&A and then she will, um, while we are doing the webinar, actually live answer all the questions. If there are any questions unanswered at the end, we'll um, cover them at the end of the webinar as well. As you see, uh, well, Giovanna is from Brazil, I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, we have our colleague Rick, who has lived in Colombia and in South Africa. Uh, Rafaela, also from Brazil, and Ellen, who is from the Netherlands, but has lived in Thailand for the majority of her life, actually. So people from, from all over the, the world. Um, to introduce Expert Housing Network a bit, uh, we are no traditional real estate agents. Why do we say that? Um, well, first of all, we help with only buying and with renting properties. So we don't sell properties, we don't let properties. We're merely focused on securing homes for our clients, either on the purchase side or the rental side. Uh, we charge a fixed fee. We don't believe in commissions. Uh, we think if you are paying, um, you know, a million euros or 100k, um, you should be paying the same amount as the, the job that we're doing is pretty much on the same side. Um, as you saw on the previous slide, a lot of my colleagues are from abroad or have lived abroad. Um, in other words, we know what it's like to settle in a new country. Uh, the added value of EHN, well, selling agents uh, take offers from EHN more seriously as they know that we're uh, experienced and have a background in real estate. Uh, we can sometimes book viewings when it's no longer possible. Uh, a lot of selling agents actually have specific time slots for clients with buying agents, uh, meaning that if you're calling yourself, they might say we're fully booked. If I call, they'll have another day available. Um, very important one we support by reviewing Dutch legal and property documents, um, especially in Amsterdam area, but also in the other parts of, of the Netherlands. Um, the yeah, uh, process of purchasing a home can be quite in-depth and, and has a lot of legal matter to it. Um, so it's important that we support and review here. Um, also an important one, and we'll touch base on this a little bit later, is that we help to find the market value through a um, yeah, market data research or a comparable transaction analysis. Um, this is important. Why? I'll tell you later. Uh, we'll inform you about rules and regulations, and we will make sure you don't make the same mistakes as we did when we purchased our first homes. Um, like I said, I'm not here by myself, also not just with Giovanna, but I'm also joined by Robin from Mr. Mortgage. Robin, would you like to introduce your team? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Ludo. Uh, my hair dropped down to my chin, so <laughs> I am the second from the right, uh, but I'm joined by a marvelous team of Cesar, Egle and Uskan, uh, where Uskan is our kind of our mortgage Google anything, any specific uh, thing that ever came across uh, in mortgage land, he already knows says I myself have more experience when it comes to uh, helping and guiding um, our clients like you, obviously, through the whole house hunting process. Uh, we're not real estate agents. That's definitely not an expertise I will uh, <laughs> dive into. That's all Ludo and his team uh, work from the financial side. So we always know exactly what your financial situation is, 
uh, after our analysis and then can guide you from the financial side when it comes to purchasing your new home. Essentially to make sure that together we can make sure that you find the best house or Ludo and you can find the best house, of course, and we can make sure that you can rest easily in your new house that you don't have to worry about your finances, of course. Now, what we do, uh, again, we're, uh, expertise, uh, our expertise lies with experts in the internationals, all the specific situations come across there. When you move here, when, uh, when you receive a gift from abroad, for instance, all of that, uh, when you're self-employed, when you have a history of a company abroad, that's where we all have inter uh, uh, our expertise in. So if you have any questions, uh, by all means, let me know. Uh, something about myself, by the way. Uh, I also live in Amsterdam, also in Amsterdam North, uh, coincidentally, um, and I very much un understand what Lido says. It's a, it's a magnificent place, plus I've lived in every area of Amsterdam pretty much, and it's all pretty great. Um, now, we all have international uh, um, experience uh, with either living in it or uh, living abroad or uh, being in contact with a lot of different cultures, and that's also kind of what gets us going. Uh, as a team and each of us uh, individually as well to uh, to hear all the different stories from everybody that uh, comes from all over the world that's very interesting always uh, of course and uh, yeah so we're very excited to uh, to let you know everything about mortgages and the way uh, purchasing a home uh, works so uh, yeah that's about it uh, Ludo take it away perfect thank you very much for that introduction um, well now you guys know who we are and who you are looking at uh, but I think it's always nice to um, potentially tailor the uh, webinar a little bit to well, who you guys are so I started the poll just now uh, feel free to fill it in obviously not obligated but it's always nice to see where you guys are from uh, what age range you are and why you're looking for a home and um, well, potentially we can tailor a little bit to the webinar to your likings. I already see some answers coming in. Fantastic. So I see that the majority is just under 35, which is great. I'll explain to you later on. But the majority might have heard already about a nice exemption that is in play currently. Um, nice mix between singles, couples, and families. And well, this is always a nice compliment. The majority is actually uh, looking to settle in the Netherlands, um, which, again, I totally understand. Thank you very much, guys, for filling that in. All right. Well, first of all, very important thing. Uh, today's goal is to add value to you. Um, sometimes there are rumors going around that real estate agents don't like to share information freely. Um, we as expert housing network but also robin from mr mortgage don't share that opinion we think it's very important to share this information freely um, and that is obviously why we're here today as well um a few things that are good to know i think i'll move right back to you robin for the nhg the national mortgage guarantee yes um so what it is it's, it's kind of an insurance arrangement uh, the national mortgage guarantee and what it essentially means short um, if you buy a house, um, let's say for 300,000 euros right now, and you're very happy living it for five years, let's say, and disaster strikes, you lose your job, you cannot pay the mortgage anymore, you have to sell the house. Um, but even worse, and bear with me, I don't necessarily expect this to happen, especially in the larger areas, but let's say the property value decreased significantly. So you took on a mortgage for 300,000 euros. In five years, you have a remaining mortgage of 280, but the property value has dropped to, to 70. So that means that you have uh, less income, cannot afford a mortgage anymore, have to move out, and you have a remaining debt of 10,000 euros. Now, obviously, that's kind of a perfect storm that hopefully doesn't happen, but were it to happen, National Mortgage Guarantee can step in and they will pay that remaining debt for you. Um, now, they have some conditions there. Uh, one of which, and the most important, is the limit. So you can only buy a house for 355 to be able to use this national mortgage guarantee. Now, last year it was 325, and it's always based on the average selling price of properties in the whole of the Netherlands the year be uh, before. Now, already now people are, uh, the, the the calculations are being made. Uh, sometime I expect end of October, sometime in November, we'll know what the new limit is for the next year. Expected to be somewhere between the 370 and 390. Uh, because property values increased a bit again. Um, so what that means is if you buy a house next year for around 370, let's say, you can use this national mortgage guarantee to benefit from that insurance arrangement. Now, I already mentioned, I don't necessarily expect that that will happen, that your uh, value of the property will drop by that much. 
that it goes below your mortgage. So why would you still do that? Because it does cost you a bit in, uh, at the start. Uh, Ludo has a nice overview of all the costs of a mortgage uh, when you, or for financing a property and National Mortgage Guarantee will be there on it as well, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, so why would you do that if you pay for it and you don't necessarily need it? Now, a guarantee, uh, that's where banks will go crazy on because they will like that very much. They very much like guarantees. So if you have this National Mortgage Guarantee, your interest rate will be a bit lower. Um, so that's the benefit that you would have. Uh, now we'll obviously check if it makes sense for you to do so uh, and if that works out uh, like you want to. Now, um, just to be clear, you can uh, if you buy a house for 400,000 euros, you cannot take national mortgage guarantee at all, even if you take a mortgage for lower. It's really about the value and the purchase price of the property that cannot be higher than the limit of national mortgage guarantee. Uh, if it applies to you or if you're interested in, um, it makes sense to uh, leave a, a question and we can discuss it later or we can discuss it in person later on. Perfect. Thank you for that explanation. Cool. Um, another thing, transfer tax. Um, well, what is transfer tax? Transfer tax is uh, merely the, the tax that you're paying when ownership of a property is transferred from a seller to a buyer. Um, in the Netherlands, we have, technically speaking, three rates. Uh, for the transfer tax, which is kind of strange because it's the same maneuver that's happening, but we decided that we wanted three rates for that. Um, first of all, a rate that you don't see here, uh, I'll cover it very quickly. That is the rate that you pay when you're buying a property and not going to use it for your main long-term residence. This is 8% um, and that needs to be paid, for example, if you want to rent out the property immediately or using it as another investment kind of property. Um, assuming that the majority of the people here in the webinar are looking for a property to live in themselves, we'll cover the uh, most popular two different rates. First of all, um, and we'll go to the far right example that we see on uh, here, um, it's a couple both aged, um, well, in this case, over 35 years old. Um, the uh, purchase price is over 400K, in this case, 500. Um, very simple. Kate pays her 2% uh, and John pays his 2% over their property share, assuming that they both own 50% of the property. In this case, they pay 2% transfer tax over the purchase price. Um, this is the most common transfer tax that we see. However, um, the Dutch government came with an exemption to make it more attractive for starters on the market to buy a property, to make it cheaper, so to say. And this is where they introduced the transfer tax exemption. And there are a few things that you, um, a few requirements that you have to meet um, if you want to make use of this exemption. First of all, you have to be under 35 years old. So not 35 or younger, but you have to be under 35 years old. The property purchase price, so not the value, not the asking price, not the mortgage amount, but the purchase price needs to be 400,000 euros or less. And it needs to be the first time that you're using this exemption. So if we look on the completely left example, we have a situation where Kate and John are both under 35 years old, let's say they're 33. Their purchase price is 400K, could have been 350, could have been 300, but cannot be over 400. In this case, the transfer tax is 0%. So they are not paying transfer tax over the not purchase. Now we have quite a, um, a funny rate, which I didn't mention in the beginning, um, but uh, that is the one that we see in the middle. And this is um, yeah, something that we don't see every day, but it does happen. Uh, in this case, Kate is 37. She's over 35 years old. And John, however, is under 35 years old. In this example, he's 33. The purchase price is again, 400,000 euros. What happens here? Kate becomes 50% owner of the property and John becomes 50% uh, owner of the property. So Kate is paying 2% over her share, 2% over 50%, and John is paying 0% over his share. He's paying 0% over 50% ownership. In this case, in totality, they're paying together 1% transfer tax. Um, Technically, John is paying nothing, Kate is paying two, but um, nine out of 10 times people will try to buy together. So they'll pay 1% of the um, purchase price. On the right bottom, you see visit the transfer tax checker. Um, when you get the recording tomorrow together with the slides, you can press on that button. You can fill in some personal details and um, well, the, the calculator will show you how much transfer tax you'll be paying. Um, cool. Let's see where you guys are in the process. 
um, if you're just in the orientation phase, if you're already viewing properties, uh, sometimes we even have people here in the webinar that have an offer accepted already, uh, which is amazing. It means that uh, we can handle it quickly. And I think that the majority will be um, in the researching phase. I think indeed the uh, answers from the poll. I think we have a few people who are already doing some viewings. It's also nice. And the majority in the research phase, fantastic. Thank you very much guys for filling that in. Cool, all right, let's talk about renting versus buying. Maybe strange that we're talking about renting in a, in a webinar that is focused on buying a home in the Netherlands, uh, but I think it's important to know the, the differences. So a few things or a few factors where we say, okay, maybe it's smart to rent a property. First of all, some benefits from renting a property is that you have a lot of flexibility. Um, you don't have a lot of ties tied to the uh, property itself. Nine out of 10 times, if you have a Model A contract, you have a one month uh, notice period. So if all of a sudden your employer says, hey, uh, Ludo, do you want to start living in Malaysia and um, uh, get a job there? I just have to tell my landlord, man, I'm leaving and I have to pay one month rent and that's it. So you have a lot of flexibility and you can go pretty much wherever you like. Um, there are no taxes. Well, not completely. There's one tax that is always for the homeowner, and that's the uh, garbage removal tax. Um, something to keep in mind. But besides that, there are no taxes or big costs for maintenance. If a window breaks, if there's roof maintenance, if the window frames need painting, um, if the dishwasher breaks, all of that, that is all for the landlord. And therefore, the costs of maintaining the property are either zero or very slim for a tenant. Besides that, um, there are no initial costs when it comes to renting a home. Um, it says here no down payment. Um, of course, there is a deposit needed, but the deposit, um, if everything goes well, is something that you get back after your rental period. So in broader sense, there are no down payments when you're, uh, or when you're uh, renting a property. Uh, we'll touch base on this a little bit later when we look at the closing fees when you're buying a home. But buying a home itself costs money. When it comes to notary fees, the transfer tax, what we just saw, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a little bit easier to rent a home with if you or your capital is a little bit lower. Um, well, then there are some cons um, when, when owning a home. I think they correlate with the things that we just mentioned. You have taxes, you have costs when it comes to maintenance, and it's a little bit more difficult to move as, uh, well, you first have to sell your property before you can actually leave the house. Um, unless you have enough um, money in the bank that you can keep your two properties. Um, well, we hope that you're still interested in buying a home because there are definitely a lot of pros when it comes to owning a home. Um, first of all, you have stability, uh, right? There's no one that can tell you you need to leave your house unless you stop paying your mortgage installments, but assuming that every, everyone is um, a good citizen and, and will just keep paying to their bank, um, you can stay in the house for as long as you want. Um, if a recession hits, or if um, there is some instability in the rest of the world, as long as you keep paying your mortgage installments, you have your home and you can stay in there. So it, it gives you a, a stable environment and a stable home environment, let's say. Um, instead of paying rent, you're paying uh, monthly mortgage installments. Um, obviously, you're also paying a little bit of interest on that, but the um, uh, yeah, larger sum is um, repayments to the bank. And this is actually putting the money in your, in, your, in your house, putting the money in the brick, so to say. So you're building up equity. Every month, you're paying back part of your loan. And um, well, you can see this as some kind of a saving as well. So you're building up equity. Um, currently, there's still a scheme in the Netherlands where the mortgage interest, um, where there's a mortgage interest deduction, um, meaning that you can get a part of your um, interest that you paid back from your, um, what's it called, income, income taxes at the end of the year. Um, again, some calls from renting your home down below. Rents will uh, keep on rising, at least that's the expectancy. Now also with the rule that you have to live in a property yourself for at least well, four years, it is in Amsterdam when buying under 512,000 euros, the amount of rental properties are going down and this will most likely create another rise in rents. Um, there are no tax benefits when you're renting a home and there's no creation of wealth. You're paying off something else's mortgage pretty much. Um, Robin, the financial side of renting versus buying. Yes, uh, of course, you have, you have to consider the, the difference there. Now, strictly speaking, usually when you compare two separate, uh, similar properties like we did here as well, 
uh, considering the interest rate is close to 4%, a little bit under now, luckily, but uh, with the duration of 30 years, then you can calculate the monthly payment for your mortgage. Now, in this case, that would be 2,363 uh, uh, euros. Um, whereas the um, uh, monthly payment for the uh, renting the property was, I think, was close to 2,700 euros. Now, all in all, already there you see you have uh, over 300 euros benefit when you rent instead of um, uh, when you buy instead of rent. Now, that's a good thing, all in all. But as Ludo already mentioned, you do have um, in the investment you have to start off with when you purchase a property to essentially uh, pay all the costs when you do have to pay transfer tax, for instance. And all the remaining costs that again little will show you an overview in a bit um so then you have to consider okay when does it start making sense to buy instead of rent essentially you break even in about 22 months um so that means in less than two years if you already live in the property for less than 10 years or two years it makes sense to buy a property to be perfectly honest, I would say stay in the property for about three, four, maybe five years. If that's your uh, horizon, then it really starts making sense because then you can benefit more from the increase of value. And this is exactly what that would mean, the increase in value. Um, it doesn't really state it here even. Uh, this just states after five years, excluding the increased value, again, just what you repaid in your mortgage. So the total monthly payments over five years um, when having a mortgage is 141,000 euros, plus the equity part is fit almost 50,000 euros there. So that means that well, from the 141, you kind of save up uh, 50,000 euros because you repay that on a mortgage. If you sell your house, you get that money back from the selling, of course. Now, when you're renting a property, then the monthly payments for over five years is 180,000 euros, which for one is way more than uh, buying it for the mortgage payments. And you don't build up any, anything out of that monthly payment. So in that sense, when you plan to stay for a longer term in the property, it makes more sense to buy right now. Uh, but again, uh, every person is different. So please look at your personal situation, but cold comparison, it makes more sense to buy if you stay in the property for a longer term. Indeed, no, that's, uh, that's for sure. All right, cool. Let's look at some market drivers. Uh, we've all heard in the last couple of months that the price of purchase homes have gone up, just like the rents. Um, and let's see what a few reasons for that could be. Well, first of all, we have quite some fiscal benefits currently um, in the Netherlands that make it attractive to buy a property. First of all, the transfer tax exemption that we talked about, um, the interest rate or the interest um, uh, deduction um, something that that is most likely i think they're talking about potentially um, uh, getting rid of that um, but uh, for now it's it's a very interesting thing for sure um, there are no capital gains in the netherlands meaning that um, if you make a nice buck on the um, sale of your property you can put everything either in your pocket or into a new uh, property or pretty much do whatever you want with the money so there are no gains on the capital that you earn um, currently, there's still a tax-free parent donation. Um, it's called a tax-free parent donation. However, it's actually the first line of family members. Um, so um, if you have a very rich uncle um, or brother that wants to donate you money, that is always uh, possible as well. Uh, currently, it's at 100,000 euros, um, a little over, I think, 100, 102 or something like that. Um, next year, this is going down to around 30,000 euros. And then starting from 2024, um, it is yeah, gone. Um, please keep in mind, this is if your parents live in the Netherlands. If you have any family members um, outside of the Netherlands, um, nine of 10 times, the, the limit is even a bit higher. And uh, the, the Netherlands yeah, likes receiving money from other countries. So it shouldn't be an issue to get uh, a nice donation as well. Um, well, low interest rates. We know that the interest rates have gone up in the last couple of months, but looking at historical interest rates, um, it is still on the rather low side. If you ask me, I'm not a, a mortgage advisor or a financial um, specialist, but I think 4% is still rather on the low side. Um, so um, yeah, we still have rather low interest rates. Um, this is what we mentioned before, rents are on the rather high side, um, so it makes more sense to buy property and pay back your monthly installments instead of paying high rents. Um, and currently it's so, so difficult to find a rental property, it is uh, it's really insane. 
Um, and I think this is a very big market driver as well, is that there are just a lot more people looking for a purchase home compared to people um, offering a purchase home. So there's just a lack of supply. And the expect expectancy is that this will um, stay the same for at least another 10 or 20 years. Um, the government has a lot of ideas about um, yeah, building new uh, buildings and building new housing. But um, yeah, a lot of popular hubs in the Netherlands are already full, like Utrecht, Amsterdam, Haarlem, Rotterdam. Um, at one point, these are the places where people want to live and there's just not a lot of place to build anymore. Um, so yeah, lack of supply will most likely stay in thing. Um, then something we, we uh, touched base on before, at least mentioned a couple of times, what would you need in savings before you actually start in the buying process? A few things. We'll go from top to bottom. Uh, first of all, uh, you'll need some cash for the transfer tax, um, obviously not for uh, new builds or for people that are under 35, under buying under 400K and using the exemption for the first time. But otherwise, this will be 2% of the purchase price. Um, the notary, um, the notary does um, two things, the mortgage deed and the transfer deed between 600 to 1100 euros per deed. Right? Um, if you're looking in Amsterdam, and this is Amsterdam specifically, uh, the notary also drafts up the purchase agreement. So there's an additional fee for that around 500 euros uh, on top. Um, everywhere outside of Amsterdam, the transfer, the purchase agreement is drafted up by the selling agent. So that saves you a bit. Um, if you're working with a bank or with a mortgage advisor, uh, the uh, price is between 1500 and 3400 euros. Typical real estate agent charges around 1% to 2% of the purchase price. Please keep in mind, we from Expert Housing Network charge a fixed fee, so not a 1% to 2%. Um, if you're getting a mortgage, an appraisal is required. This is a person that comes into the property to actually give the um, market value of the property, writes up a report, and sends it to the bank. I will also do a price research before we make the offer, um, but unfortunately, the bank will not take my report as a, um, <laughs> as a as an actual market value. Luckily, my report and the appraiser's report is nine out of ten times very very similar. Um, so, uh, but yeah, that's why we need the appraiser between five hundred fifty and nowadays around seven hundred euros. Um, technical inspector around 425 euros, not something that is obligated, but something that can be handy, especially if you're looking to, uh, to buy a property that is on the older side. If you don't master the Dutch language, then at the um, signing of the transfer and the mortgage deed, you need to have a sworn in interpreter present. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite funny because normally the notaries, they speak fluent English and very well English, but um, I think this is also a nice way to keep the interpreter business going. Um, I would always advise you to go for English if your English is sufficient, as um, English is the cheapest language, so to say, as the majority of the interpreters speak English. Um, if you have or you speak a language that is, uh, is not spoken that much, then um, yeah, the price of the interpreter can go up a little bit. Um, then. The bank guarantee, uh, well, when you're buying a property, you have to make a deposit to, deposit to show to the sellers that you are going to fulfill your obligation. This is always 10% of the purchase price. Um, you can make this 10% out of own pocket and you don't need a bank guarantee, but um, it is very logical that you don't just have 10% of the purchase price on a bank. So you can also ask the bank to actually make a deposit on your behalf. This is typically around 250 euros or 1% of the guaranteed amount. And then the last one, the NHG, uh, if you want to make use of this measure, you have to pay a one-time fee of 0.6% of the mortgage amount um, to get access to the NHG and to the um, cheaper uh, interest rates. Now we have a third column on the right uh, with the question if it's tax deductible or not. As you can see, everything that is mortgage related is actually tax deductible. So this is the mortgage deeds, uh, the mortgage advisor costs or the bank's cost, the appraisal and the NHG fee. Um, funny enough, if the bank um, uh, requires you to do a technical inspection, then um, the technical inspection is also uh, tax deductible. Um, however, I've never seen a situation where the bank actually requires someone to do a technical inspection unless they're really buying a property that's falling apart, um, which I would nine or 10 times advise you not to buy anymore. All right, well, this is an important one as well. I think this will add, uh, add quite some value. Three tips to win in the current market. First of all, we want to look at value. Now, why is this so important? I'll explain to you. 
Um, here we have a property, uh, quite a nice property, and the asking price is 395,000 euros. Unfortunately, there are no rules in the Netherlands when it comes to um, the amounts that a selling agent can put on Fonda uh, when it comes to asking price. Um, it can be a, really a random number. So in this case, we see that the asking price is 395,000 euros. However, after doing a price research, we see that the market value of the property is actually 415,000 euros. Well, currently, as everyone knows, it's quite overheated on the market. Properties aren't being bought at market value, but they're being bought a little bit over market value. So the buyer for this property had to add 20,000 euros out of own pocket and bought the property at 435,000 euros. Now, as you see here, the um, um, overbidding that we see a lot from, or that we hear a lot from, for example, uh, the news, but also people that are uh, buying properties, it seems like the overbidding here is 10% over the asking price. Well, that's indeed the case, but it's over the asking price. And as I mentioned before, the asking price doesn't say that much um, because this selling agent could have, technically speaking, put the property on Funda for 100,000 euros. Yeah, then the overbid would be 400%. Uh, so um, that, that doesn't say too much. So I want to look at the difference between market value and purchase price as an overbid. When I'm talking about overbidding, I, I use those two references. Now, as we see here, the overbid was only, I'm calling it in brackets, obviously, but only 4.8% over the market value. Now, if we go to uh, another example, um, same property, but a different selling agent. This selling agent actually listed the property at 375. Market value is still 415, purchase price still 435. Now in this case, the um, overbid over asking price was 16%. Seems like a, a crazy amount, which it is, but actually over market value, the overbid was still 4.8%. So that's why it's very important to know what the market value is, because based on the market value, we can come up with a competitive offer and um, see what is needed to actually uh, secure the property. So once we know, um, and this is what I always tell my clients, once you know the market value, I want to disregard the asking price completely. Don't look at it. It doesn't add value anymore. We want to know what the market value is because this is the max amount that the bank will give to you when it comes to a mortgage as well. And this is the amount that we should raise our competitive offer. Um, well, once we know the um, value and we know what uh, we want to bid, we can actually come up with a offer. And the funny thing is uh, submitting a, a winning offer doesn't always mean submitting a highest uh, offer. It's, uh, it means submitting a good price, right? And what do I mean with that? Maybe it's good to go back to this one. If the market value is 415 and we make an offer of, let's say 500, which is obviously ridiculous. Um, and we say, but we also need uh, a mortgage of 500. And the bank will never give us 500 for this property because the value is 415. So, um, you know, we can say we will pay a million for this house, but if we need a mortgage of a million, yeah, the, the seller is not going to accept our offer because the bank will never give us a million. So um, that's why it's important to offer a good price, knowing what the market value is, knowing that we can cover the 20,000 euros out of our pocket and saying, okay, we will need a mortgage of 415, but we're willing to add a, a few thousand euros to actually secure the property. So offering a good price is, is important here. Um, then I just mentioned, we can say to the sellers, we need a certain amount of mortgage to move forward with the purchase. Um, this is offering security to a, uh, to yourself, actually, to the buyer, because you say, if the bank rejects my mortgage application, I can cancel the purchase without having any consequences, without any uh, financial fees or anything like that. However, um, we can also offer a bit more security to the seller. So what we can say, hey, I'm, I'm willing to make an offer of 435, but um, I need a mortgage of only 200,000 euros. You're still free to uh, apply for a mortgage of higher. Uh, if the value is 415, you can still apply for a mortgage of 415. However, you say to a seller, if my um, mortgage application of 415 gets rejected, I still need to move forward with the purchase as my financial clause, uh, my insurance that says, if I do not move forward, if I do not get a mortgage application approved, um, I don't have to move forward with the purchase, is locked in at 200K. Um, it just gives a bit more security to a seller side. Now you're also free to actually take out this clause completely and say, even if my bank rejects my mortgage application completely, I will still move forward with the purchase. Now, obviously uh, the seller doesn't always um, um, 
expect you to put up the 435 out of own pocket. Um, but this will mean that you have to pay the cancellation fee, which is the deposit amount, aka the 10% of the purchase price. So you would lose 10% uh, of the purchase price um, if you get your mortgage rejected. Now, obviously, we want to um, be careful with this clause because 10% um, yeah, of the purchase price is quite a lot that you would lose in this case. So I would only take out the financial clause in consultation with uh, Robin, for example. Um, and luckily, Robin can do a full in-depth research to see if you're actually liable or um, um, if you are applicable or able to get an actual mortgage. So that, uh, that is very nice. Um, but it could definitely add value to take out that, that uh, it can definitely increase your chances. Um, cool. Third bullet point, offering the least amount of hassle. Well, this just means adding uh, as uh, a little amount of clauses as possible. For example, the technical inspection clause, if sellers want to move quickly, it's something we can take out of the um, um, offer uh, to create the least amount of hassle. And then the last one, it's a funny thing we see um, being uh, more and more important the last couple of months, and that's adding a personal touch to the offer. Um, as a lot of properties are being bought up by investors and the majority of the sellers, well, obviously they want to make a nice uh, profit on the property, but a lot of sellers also want to yeah, give their house to a next generation that will um, really enjoy the house and uh, start a new family there, for example. Um, so offering a personal touch, sharing that you are going to take good care of the property can sometimes make a difference of five or 10,000 euros. I had a case a few weeks ago where um, the highest offer was, I think, 1.15. And um, my buyers, they sent a video explaining who they were and how enthusiastic they were about the property. And they were able to buy the property for yeah, 15,000 euros under the highest offer. But the sellers were so um in love with my clients they were like no, we're already getting such a high amount we need to make sure this property goes to the right family instead of someone that is going to flip it and sell for much more so something that is uh, something that's important then the last one um and that's the due diligence we have the technical inspector and the appraiser well, before we move forward um I already explained what, what these two do. My question to you guys, do you think you book them before or after your offer is accepted? And feel free to just pop it in the chat. I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are about this. Um, just to see what your, your gut feeling would say when it comes to um, booking the, the third parties. I see some befores coming in. <clears throat> that would make sense indeed. Uh, also an after and some more befores. Well, maybe I shouldn't um, keep you suspended much longer. I think um, I'm getting some more afters in there as well. Well, this is the sweet spot, right after the offer is accepted. Why is that? Um, as we saw in a, in a few slides before, is that unfortunately the technical inspector and the appraiser, they don't work for free. Um, they charge their fees as well. Now, in the current market, it is not very typical to get your first offer accepted. Um, if we have to get the appraiser in and the technical inspector in every time for a property that we might not even secure, it's going to cost us a lot of money, right? The appraiser is around 600 euros, the technical inspector 425. That costs us more than 1,000 euros every time that we want to make an offer. So this is why we say, okay, I, as a buying agent, will do my due diligence before we make the offer. I will do the price research. I will uh, see the property, I will check all the property documents to make sure that everything on paper is as it should be. And then when, uh, once our uh, offer is accepted, we'll immediately contact the third parties, make sure that they are um, in the property before we sign the purchase agreement. So we have around one and a half weeks where we can do our due diligence. As um, in the Netherlands, there is no legal um, agreement up until the moment that we sign the purchase agreement. So within this one and a half weeks, we can still cancel the purchase without any um, uh, consequences. Um, so we'll have them come in here and then hopefully around here, we will get the technical report and the appraisal report. So we know the exact value of the home. We know exactly what the um, uh, mortgage provider will be able to lend us. Um, and we'll know exactly if there are any red flags when it comes to the state of the property. Well, assuming that everything is fine and everything is as expected, we'll go either to the notary in Amsterdam or we'll receive the purchase agreement from the selling agent anywhere outside of Amsterdam. We'll sign the contract. 
and then uh, we have another three days to, uh, and this is a legal term or legal time period that uh, everyone in the Netherlands has when they buy a home, um, to still uh, yeah, cancel the purchase without any consequences. So after signing, you still have three days to wake up in the middle of the night sweating, thinking, oh my God, what did I do? I need to cancel this. Then you can still do so. After the cooling off period, um, you are fully binded to the contract and everything within the contract is uh, applicable. To give a little broader timeline um, of how the buying process looks like, um, from, from left to right, we'll start the search um, over here. So we'll, we'll find some properties on Funda. I'll ask you uh, to, to wake up or when you wake up, have your cup of coffee every morning, uh, have a look at Funda, see if anything is newly listed. Um, I always think it's funny that this is so, uh, it, it looks like this is a very short period, but this is where a lot of work happens actually. Um, because this is where you go to the viewing, you decide if you want to move forward or not. If you do, then I will, as a buying agent, start the price research and start the property document review. You'll also be in contact with Robin to send a property where Robin can actually um, give you some heads up um, when it comes to, for example, ground lease, energy label, um, anything like that that might impact the um, mortgage cap. Um, if everything is aligned and uh, all the lights are still green, then we will submit the offer. It's a few day or a few hours of sitting like this, hoping to get some good news from the selling agent. Assuming that we do, um, this is the one and a half week that we just looked at, the due diligence week where we book in the third parties and eventually sign the purchase agreement. This is also the moment uh, when we have the appraisal report and the uh, purchase agreement where uh, Robin can officially apply for the mortgage. Um, so right after we sign it, uh, please send all the documents to Robin so he can start um, applying for the mortgage. That can still happen in the three-day cooling off period as well. Well, at one point, uh, the, the cooling off period ends, obviously. Um, this is a time period, it says here on average four weeks. I know that Robin can do it a lot quicker. Um, but let's say three to four weeks where uh, Robin is applying, maybe even two. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there you go. One or two is even possible now. Wow, yeah. okay. There uh, you go. No, we don't want to waste time. It's... Exactly. It's, 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 we say on average four weeks, but um, the, the magic hands of Robin can do it, uh, can do it a lot quicker. <laughs> um, then we get, uh, we get some other good news. This is where the mortgage application is approved. Um, I would say this, together with uh, getting the offer accepted, are the biggest hooray moments uh, because after getting the mortgage approved, not a lot can go wrong more. Now, depending on the date that has been agreed upon with the sellers, we will wait until we can have the key handover or the transfer date. About a week or two before that date, you will receive a statement of completion. This is a fancy word for final invoice from the notary. Um, this final invoice not only has the purchase price on it, but also has my fees on it, Robin's fees on it, the transfer tax, any municipal taxes that still need to be paid. Um, anything that is related to the purchase besides the appraisal of the technical inspector, and they like to send their, their invoices directly to you. But everything will be collected together on the final invoice or the statement of completion. You'll pay this, um, then on the transfer date, we'll first go to the property, make sure that the house is still in the same state as we expect it to be. Um, to give a little example, I've had a case where we bought a three bedroom apartment during the time of the signing of the purchase agreement and the transfer deed. The sellers were like, oh, those two, three bedrooms are rather small. Let's take down a wall so we create two big bedrooms. Yeah, obviously this is <laughs> not the way it should go and also not allowed. Um, so at the final inspection, we actually saw that and we had to delay the transfer because they had to put back a wall. Um, so that's why it's important why we go to, to the property. Um, but hey, we'll, we'll assume that everything is as we still want it to be and expect it to be. We'll go to the notary then to sign the transfer deed and the mortgage deed. And this is where you get the keys and you open the bottle of champagne and it's party time. Now we still have here, it says here a two month liability term. I do have to say it's, it's a rather gray area. Um, I always advise my clients to use the house intensively within the first two weeks of the property, open all the windows, open all the heaters, um, just make sure that everything works as you want it to be, because in this time period, if anything is broken um, that wasn't inspected at the final inspection, we can still hold the sellers liable and ask them to fix it. Alrighty, cool. Well, we've moved on to the frequently asked questions. There are always a bunch of questions that we get asked quite a lot, so we decided to bundle them. Giovanna, do you want to jump in here? Hello. Hi, guys. Hello. Yes, yes. Perfect. 
Thank you. Um, so the first one, can I get a mortgage with a temporary contract or as a freelancer? So I guess uh, we pass that to Robin. <laughs> yeah, <that's nice. laughs> um, short answer, uh, yes. Usually, yes. Um, obviously, it's a, bit, it's a bit more details, a bit more to it. So let's start with a, a temporary contract. Um, so obviously, when you go to a bank or through us to a bank and then uh, you want to apply for a mortgage, they will be the happiest if you have a permanent contract or an indefinite contract. So if you have a temporary contract, no problem necessarily, uh, because what the banks will want to know from your employer is if, if they are um, expected, if they expect to keep you on as an employee for the longer time. So what they could give out is a so-called declaration of intent. Uh, what they say essentially is sure um, uh, this lovely person works with us and we are very happy with what they do and we intend to keep them on after this time period uh, of the temporary contract has ended um, it's an intention it's not legally binding it doesn't cost anything for the uh, for your employer and it doesn't hurt them in any way so usually uh, uh, employers are willing to do that um, if you need to if your employer needs any uh, information about it they can always reach out to us or we can reach out to them so temporary contract, uh, declaration of intent, and you're all good. If you don't have that, there are still possibilities, but then it really depends on your personal situation, your specific contracts, and how long you've been in the Netherlands for. And again, uh, reach out and we can see what this, this specifically means to you. So that's the temporary contract taken care of. So when you're employed. Now, when you're a self-employed or a freelancer or a business owner, pretty much all the same way to look at it. Um, it's not as black and white uh, because there uh, it also kind of depends what kind of company do you have, how long has it been uh, in existence for. Um, basically, when you what you will read online is you need at least three years history of your company in the Netherlands. That's not necessarily the, the case. One year is sufficient. It has to be 12 months or 365 days, one full year history in the Netherlands. Now, the thing is, when you have one year, it doesn't give a lot of security to the bank, of course. When you have two years, it gives more security. Three years, that's where they were very happy. Now, what we can do is if you, for instance, moved your company from abroad to the Netherlands and you registered here for a year, then we can look into if we can use your history abroad as a history we can base the future and your mortgage on as well. So again, it's, it really depends on what your specific situation is. Baseline is you need at least 12 months to be able to secure a mortgage here in the Netherlands, then we, then we can look into what your options are. Okay, uh, so I yeah. guess that also uh, answered the question that we have. Uh, we have one question in the Q&A that was almost the same, so um, um, <laughs> it also helps. <laughs> Move on to the next one. What happens if you want to leave the country after several years? Um, yeah, I will, I guess I will leave that to Ludo. Or yeah. Perfect. Yeah, there you Thank go. you. Yeah. Um, well, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question, especially for um, expats, right? There are people who come here for an adventure, but after a few years might want to move on to their next adventure. If they bought a house in the meantime, um, a few things can happen. Let's move to the next slide. So first of all, um, a very easy one. You can keep your home, but you also keep your mortgage costs. Um, if you have a mortgage on the house, so you can you can keep the house here, um, used as a vacation home, or um, potentially rent it out at a certain time, um, and that also brings us to bullet point two, is renting out your home. Good to keep in mind though is you need permission from the bank, um, because when you nine of ten times when you buy a property and you're going to live in it, you're going to get a residential mortgage. So um, there are some specifics that only apply for residential mortgage, for example, a bit lower interest rate, uh, the fact that you can get 100% um, mortgage of the value of the house. Um, a inter or investment mortgage is a little bit different than that. Um, so you'll need permission from the bank and sometimes you'll need to change your mortgage type as well. But technically speaking, um, if you meet other requirements, you can rent out your home. Good to keep in mind, and this is something that is new. Uh, a lot of municipalities in the Netherlands have um, added a self-habitation obligation um, to a lot of properties, meaning that you have to live in the property for a certain amount of years before you can rent it out. You can sell before then, but you can't rent it out before then. Um, there's a cap on the value or the purchase price of the properties, or the WZ value of the properties. So um, 
uh, yeah, check with your municipality or with your buying agent if these rules are applicable for you. And then the third one, the most easy one, I think, is uh, if you want to leave the property, leave the country, you can sell your house, and there are no penalties or capital gain taxes. Um, so at one point, maybe the market has risen a bit. Um, you have uh, paid back some of your loan, and you can put the money that you make from that in your pocket, take it to your next adventure. I have another one. Um, can I rent out my house or a room in my house, an apartment, a property? So I'll give, I will leave that to you as well, Ludo. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a two-factor. Um, maybe uh, uh, we can both answer it, Robin. Um, but I, I mentioned it before. Um, short answer, yes, you can rent out your house and you also can rent out your room. Um, renting out a room is a little bit easier <clears throat> as um, um, yeah, you need to have an agreement with your roommate. Uh, make sure everything is on paper so that there are no disputes when you want to sell your house or uh, want to leave your property. Uh, but um, besides that, you don't really need permission from your bank to do so. Um, when it comes to renting out your whole house, like mentioned before, have a chat with your bank about it. You might want to change your, or might have to change your mortgage type. Um, and um, you need to meet the requirements if there are any self habitation obligations. But yeah, it is, it is possible. Uh, yeah, correct. And, and to add a couple of things from the mortgage side to that, um, when you rent out a room, um, it is possible when you call the bank and say, hey, I'm renting out my room, they will get a bit nervous. Uh, the reason why is that when you have a roommate, they will have certain tenant rights. Um, so you cannot just kick them out when you want to sell the house. And that's a bit of a pickle because if you want to sell your house and somebody's living in there, that's harder to sell, obviously. Property will uh, value would decrease and all. Um, so what you what I would suggest to do is to have um, an eviction clause in your contract that you say, okay, sure, you can rent part of my house, you can rent out, uh, you can rent a room, but I will give you two months' notice if I'm selling my house, and then you don't have all this, those issues that you have to sell the house with somebody in there. That's for one. Uh, renting out a room, that's fine. The income though that you have. The rental income from renting out a room will be taxed to a certain amount. So by all means, be well informed when you want to do that. Um, when you rent out your entire house or your entire uh, the property that you're renting out, um, your mortgage has to be adjusted. No lender will allow you to rent out your property um, when you're renting it out, only when they send you abroad and you come back at a very specific time, no more than three years. That's very specific. And if that's the case, then sure, there are possibilities. Otherwise, you have to adjust your mortgage from a residential mortgage into an investment mortgage, because that's what it will turn into. M most important thing that you have to consider then is that um, they don't give you 100% mortgage. They only give you about 70% mortgage. So then we have to see what the current value is, your outstanding mortgage, anything that you have to uh, lower more to get to 70% has to come out of your savings. So those are things to definitely consider. When you want to do that, there are possibilities, but we are uh, well informed, of course. Yeah. Great. So uh, I guess move to the next one. What is the 10% deposit I need to complete? Um, I leave that to Ludo as well. Or, yeah, I would say Ludo. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, well, uh, I mentioned it a little bit uh, earlier already. Uh, but within every uh, purchase and every purchase agreement, it is mentioned that a buyer needs to make a 10% deposit uh, when moving forward with the buying process. Now, this is um, in place to make sure that a buyer um, fulfills its obligations that are mentioned in the purchase agreement. Because technically speaking, I mean, when you're signing a purchase agreement, you're entering into a contract where the seller says it's going to sell and the buyer is going to buy. Um, but um, up until that moment, or if there's no deposit up until the transfer date, no payment is being made. So there's no way to really make sure that the buyer is actually moving forward, making sure that he's getting a mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. Um, technically speaking, a buyer could then flee the country, go to Panama and never show his face ever again. And then the, the seller is there still with his house and in a, excuse my language, a shitty situation. So um, this is why they're at one point they said, okay, we need some kind of um, incentive for a buyer to fulfill their actions and obligations. And that's where they come up, came up with the 10% deposit. So this is um, either you get it back at the end when you um, make the full payment from a mortgage side, or if um, um, 
you are you can also use this 10 percent to uh, pay partial the, the purchase price that's the 10 percent deposit thank you <laughs> oh yeah maybe it's uh, handy to show where this needs to be made so we have the uh, timeline here um Typically, it's um, and that this is also something that we formulate in the offer. It's around one week after the mortgage application is approved. So if we say, okay, we need a mortgage of X amount and we need four weeks to get that uh, mortgage, then typically we'll say we'll make the deposit on the fifth week after signing the purchase agreement. So right around here or so. There we go. What are our fees? And the fees from the uh, expect uh, from the Mr. Mortgage as well. Yeah, yeah. So we'll start uh, with the uh, well, with my fees with our fees. Currently, we have uh, three packages, two packages plus a new build package. Um, we'll start on the left, smart package. This is a package for yeah, more the, the independent buyer, someone who potentially has already bought a property before, knows a bit more about the uh, process or just really likes being totally invested within the process. So um, there are a few more things that you're doing yourself. You're booking the viewings yourself. You're going to the viewings yourself and you will also attend all the other physical third party meetings by yourself. Obviously, I'll still be here to um, do all the research. So we'll review all the property documents. We'll do the price research. I'll be in contact with the selling agents, make the offer on your behalf, book the third parties for you, uh, review all the uh, reports, like the technical report, um, appraisal report, and most importantly, the purchase agreement. But I'll also review the transfer deed and all that kind of stuff. So I'll be there um virtually to hold your hand but not not physically that is where the complete package comes in um this is more for you know, let's say the hard worker the person that is uh, not very familiar with the process and would like some more um on-site support so i'll be there to to schedule the viewings for you i'll also actually attempt the viewing so i'll be there to answer any questions that you have but most importantly uh, ask the right questions to the selling agent and then I'll also be there at the um, technical inspection, at the notary, final inspection, and then the notary uh, again. And I'll be there for the full transfer support. Um, well, if you are looking specifically for a new build, so a property that actually hasn't been built yet, a new build project, uh, then the process is a little bit different because obviously we can't view anything that hasn't been built yet. Uh, we also can do a technical inspection where the property has been built yet. So the, the process is a bit different. That's why we also have a different package for that. Um, and that's something that you can see on the right side. So we'll actually attempt the meetings with the developer, with the seller. Uh, we'll go through all the um, uh, technical reviews. Um, and again, obviously the, the contracts, et cetera, et cetera. That is a bit of, of uh, you know, what kind of services we offer uh, for every uh, package we ask a deposit payment um, it's 499 euros once that is in we can get started with the process um, obviously that will be deducted from the final amount which is only due completely at the end when we get you to the notary yes there we are um, so yeah we, we also have a fee of course we also have a fixed fee um, uh, and no cure no pay part there as well we always start with the financial analysis uh, and we charge a small down payment of 299 euros for that uh, because we don't do uh, a random check on online calculator or uh, like or when you call a bank they pretty much do the same thing also use an online calculator to check what your options are um, but if you call five different banks or check five different online calculators you always get different numbers the reason why is because they all use different parameters that you have to use i think there might be something wrong with the screen there there's a switch there yeah, there we are. Thanks. Um, so uh, we do an extensive check of your financial situation to be exactly sure what your range is, uh, not for just one bank, but we work with over 35 different banks. So we can see what in your specific situation, what is the best setup of your mortgage? Uh, what is the best interest rate? How can we optimize the setup of your mortgage as well to make sure uh, that you know exactly what your range is? Not just now, but we do that throughout the whole process. So throughout the whole process that you're looking for your property, regardless of how long it takes, regardless of how many calculations we do or how many chats we make, we do, we have, uh, we always uh, will update your uh, information. So we always know exactly what your range is. 
Um, we want to do that because we want to make sure that you have the best set of cards to actually win uh, a bit when you do so and with confidence as well. So like uh, Ludo already mentioned that you can may maybe drop the financing clubs because you your financial situation is secure enough to do that. Uh, and we on only do that when we are very, very sure that you can secure a mortgage, of course. Now we have four different packages essentially. We have a, 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 a tool online as well uh, on our website where you can take exactly your situation. Uh, for instance, when you refinance your property, so when you already have a mortgage, but you want to make it into an investment mortgage, that's the left-hand side, that's $24.99 to $2,499, and the down payment is part of that, of course. Uh, First-time homebuyer or a buy to let, um, uh, so when you buy a property for whatever purpose, our fixed fee is €2,999, um, and anything over $1 million, we charge 3,799. Uh, the reason for that is because it's, it takes more time. Uh, we don't have a commission, uh, we have a fixed fee, but if we go over 1 million, it takes significantly more time to secure a mortgage for you because the banks are just a bit more picky to make sure that everything works out. So that's basically it. Um, now to not rub it in for uh, Ludo, but our fees are tax deductible and hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> okay, my fingers crossed for yours to be as well. So that means that approximately 40% you'll get back in, in when you file your tax declaration the year after. Um, also, uh, we have a, again 299 down payment. The rest is no cure, no pay. So if we cannot close a mortgage for you, you don't have to pay that. Or if you decide not to buy, you don't have to pay that as well. Now, it's easily said because due to that financial analysis, we already know we can close a mortgage for you. So we give you the security, but we also know that we can get our things done uh, when we get there. So that's uh, pretty much about it. Perfect. Cool. Makes total sense. Thank you. All right. Well, before we move forward to the Q&A, we still have some unanswered questions. So if there is anything that is still unanswered, feel free to pop it in the Q&A. Um, but before we move forward, I'm very curious what your experience was uh, from this point of the webinar. So again, I just um, I started the poll. Feel free to fill it in. I'm curious if there are things that, that you missed. Uh, feel free to pop that in the chat and potentially um, I'm curious what comes out. Afterwards, we'll move forward with the uh, with the Q and A. Yes, I have a few questions already for you. <laughs> yes, that's what we'd like to see. Are you two rubbing? <laughs> I mean, very good. <laughs> well, we're getting some great feedback. Thank you very much. It was good to hear that um, people are happy and that we added some value today. And hopefully, we can do some more with the Q and A. All right, let's get to it. Thanks, guys. Cool. All righty. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll ask the first question. Is for, uh, our first question is from Andrea. Uh, it's for Robin. Is the interest rate uh, expected to lower, to get lower? Yeah, that is a very fair question because the interest rate has increased a bit. Now, Ludo already mentioned it a bit, just to give you a bit of background information. Um, sure, you wanted to drop, obviously, makes perfect sense. Um, and when we look at the last couple of years, it was significantly lower. Uh, we knew that wasn't a durable situation. It wasn't the last thing. We knew the interest rate couldn't stay this low. Now, also, global events also made sure that uh, one another, uh, the, the interest rate has increased. Um, to give you a bit of more of a uh, historic background, 4%, somewhere between the uh, 3.5% and 5%, that's a very healthy interest rate. The reason why is because um, if banks charge you a higher interest rate, you also get a higher interest rate on your savings account. Not to say that that's definitely something you have to do, because you can also invest in all that, but it's a, it, it, it you, uh, makes sure that there's a more balanced situation in the financial market. Now, sure. Uh, things are looking a bit tough right now. Interest rates increase, but uh, I don't necessarily expect them to go crazy. We have to wait and see. Uh, a decrease, I don't necessarily expect that anytime soon, drastically. There might, there's always a bit of up and down uh, movement. We saw during the summer uh, holiday season, it increased a bit. And then after the summer holiday season ended, um, it decreased a bit. And it makes sense because more people want to sell their house, want to buy their house after having been on holiday. And then banks want to use that situation as well to drop their interest rate to be more interesting for uh, potential clients. Now, they have increased it now, uh, most, mostly due to global events and the financial situation. 
So, um, but there so they also still want to be able to uh, sell mortgages. So I don't expect a massive drop, a significant increase with some way to see. I don't expect it to go up all of a sudden uh, very quickly. So that will gradually go, and I think it will be kind of a wave situation there. Um, basically, what I'm trying to say here um, is the most important thing to look into if it makes sense to buy a house for your for you. It's not necessarily where the interest rate if it will you cannot predict the market you don't know exactly when it will drop um, so look into do you have to move do you want to move and does it make financial sense when it comes to your monthly payments that's the most important thing anything uh, just to give you a positive note on the higher interest rate um, you have a tax return on the interest rate that you pay and so that you get part of that higher interest rate that you have to pay you get that back in any case so it makes even more sense to maybe look into that monthly tax, tax rebate that you can opt for as well. So that's, uh, that's basically it. Um, I lost my crystal ball a long time ago, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you so much. <laughs> Thank you. I have a question from Anonymous Atendi. Uh, I'm gonna uh, uh, send a question to you, Ludo. Uh, in all honesty, with the current economical environment and a recession coming and potentially a real estate crash, is today the right time to buy in Amsterdam? Well, that's a, that's a fair question. A question um, I get asked a little bit more frequently, especially the last uh, last couple of weeks, months. Yes, indeed. Um, well, if we're looking at Amsterdam, Amsterdam is not that big. Um, if you look around, there is almost no square meter that is unused, um, meaning that the um, there there is a it's very difficult to add new properties or um, up the amount of properties that are currently um, in Amsterdam uh, or are available in Amsterdam. So um, where we do see that the prices are slowing down a bit, the rise is slowing down a bit, uh, maybe even stabilizing. I don't expect a, a real estate crash in Amsterdam at all, um, just because there are still so many people looking at Amsterdam, still so many expats coming here, um, uh, people coming to study here, that uh, the, the expectancy is that uh, prices will actually still um, either stay stable or um, go up again in a few years. Um, so, of course, you know, if you look back at 2016, 2017, and you see the return that you can get today, uh, that is just unnatural. It should be like it is today in the sense that if you buy a property you pay off a bit of your mortgage in a few years and maybe get some nice uh, market um, um uh, you say that the market rise as well um that that should be the um, the norm i would say so no i don't expect a um big big real estate crash uh, anytime soon um so i still think it's the right time to buy an Amsterdam. maybe it was an even better time a couple of um, months ago uh, or a year ago, but it is still a good time to buy an yeah. um, Thank you. And I guess continue with the question. Uh, uh, we have an attendee, uh, Michelle, Michelle, mm -hmm. Michelle, who I guess in a few languages, maybe I, I'm so sorry if I said it wrong. Uh, I'm at 26, I'm wondering if uh, 26 year olds, and I'm wondering if the best to already buy with my current purchase power or if, or if it's the best to wait a couple more years, but before 35, until I will probably earn more and therefore have a higher uh, purchase power. I guess uh, it's more or less what you say, of course, about the market as well, but I, I leave that to both of you regarding that. We don't know which area she's looking for as well, uh, but yeah, all depends, right? Well, I think I can take, <laughs> take a, um, a general, uh, or I have a general idea about it. Um, well, makes sense, right? I'm actually also 26. Um, and um, if for me, I'm living in Amsterdam, um, it was a very smart idea to buy a property. And uh, the reason for that being is, I, of course, I can wait, let's say, until I'm 33. But that means that I'm throwing away another uh, eight years, seven years, I'm sorry, seven years where um, I'm paying someone else's mortgage, which is pretty much what, what rent is, and then start paying back your own. So you, within those seven years, you haven't built up any equity besides you know, from savings or anything like that, but uh, nothing within your uh, housing situation. So my advice is even if you can just get a mortgage of 100,000 euros and you can sleep in a garage for, for a few years, especially if you're looking in Amsterdam, <laughs> uh, but if, you're, if the, the property is a bit smaller at that time, um, it can never hurt because besides the 
um, income that you can put in your savings account directly. Um, you're also putting some income into your bricks, uh, which is a double saving. So um, from the ex example that Robin gave before, um, over a time period of five, or in this case, seven years, you can build up quite some equity and then use that equity to, uh, together with your um, a higher purchase power from, for example, a higher income, to buy an even nicer property. So my advice would always be if you are possible or if you're able to buy a property and are expected to stay for at least four or five years, then buy a property it makes a lot more sense paying off your own mortgage than paying off someone else's mortgage. Great, Please, thank make, you. Make, yeah, make, make sure that, that it works out now. Uh, that you do feel comfortable where you're going to live. Um, sure, you can live in a garage, uh, in, in, in a, a garage box, but uh, uh, but look into if it makes sense for you. If you want to move anyway, uh, buying makes more sense to, to renting in any case. And the, the earlier you start, the earlier you paid your mortgage. So that also has a benefit to it. So, yeah. Indeed. Uh, next question, and I'm already apologizing for the pronunciation. <laughs> uh, Zotan and Nemet, I hope. Uh, uh, do I have to live and work in the Netherlands to be able to buy a property? Um, I guess since we don't know if it, there is a mortgage uh, uh, in this case, so I, yeah. Shall I take it? Yeah, of course, go for it. <laughs> buying, buying is possible. Uh, taking a leap and uh, expecting that you might want to, uh, might need a mortgage on it as well. The thing is, what you need to secure a mortgage is a BSN. That's one thing. So that's just Dutch social security number. Um, and one other thing is that you don't necessarily have to be uh, uh, live in the property, uh, live in the Netherlands now, but you have to move to the Netherlands living in that property. Um, your income, uh, if you currently live in, uh, abroad and you your employment is abroad, and then you want to buy in the Netherlands, but you keep living abroad, that's a bit of a Thing because banks again want to have security they want to know um, that you have commitment to the Netherlands not just that you're buying and then leaving again um, so if you live abroad now and you have a future job in the Netherlands and that's where we can already base the mortgage on so there are possibilities uh, but if you live abroad you stay abroad and you want to buy in the Netherlands and not close uh, and also close mortgage that's not possible unfortunately um, but buying, I mean, sure, that's uh, that's not necessarily uh, an issue. Uh, I don't know, uh, um, maybe you see that differently, do you? But I think if you want to buy, know, it's not, if you don't need a mortgage, then uh, uh, it's it's quite simple. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, continue on the mortgage. Uh, if we are from Sai Tejasvi Patapu, I hope. I'm sorry. <laughs> if we have some mortgage in a home country, do we need to declare that in the Netherlands? Uh, very good question. Um, you have to let me know. Uh, I will be your financial advisor, so uh, I'm here for you. But to be perfectly honest, I really couldn't care less about banks. Uh, the most important thing is that I want to know that you're well off. And what uh, I've there is a, a, a thing that you have to say as a financial advisor, and that's uh, you have to declare or swear or however you want to say it that you will take good care of your clients. It's kind of like um, uh, the oath that uh, a doctor will take as well in a, in a way. So that's my job. I want to make sure that you're well off. Now, um, if you have a, a mortgage abroad, uh, let me know because then we can see how that factors in your financial situation. Um, probably when you have a mortgage abroad, you also have a tenant that lives in there and pays for your mortgage anyway uh, out of uh, rental payments. So if that's the case, then that's all good. Um, if it's some countries in the European Union uh, have the same uh, credit registration uh, uh, agency type as we have in the Netherlands, uh, those countries there, it might be that your mortgage will be registered there. So if anything, just let me know. It will make sure that the mortgage um, goes as quickly and smoothly as possible. Uh, because yeah, that's uh, that's what we're here for to make sure everything works out the best. Uh, so let me know definitely because we want to know that we don't overcredit you and that you're well off and you can again rest easily at night in your new house. Um, another one, I guess uh, we can uh, uh, relay a bit of the mortgage as well. Uh, are from Lajos Horvat. Uh, are there any risks or disadvantages uh, in purchasing and subsequently owning real estate in the Netherlands without Dutch citizenship or an European citizenship? Does the um, citizenship matter in, in any aspect of the process? 
Yeah, so um, it's, it's a couple layered questions. So for one, if you uh, have a different citizenship than uh, the Dutch one, no, it doesn't matter. There's some banks that prefer you to have, uh, well, not necessarily Dutch, but EU citizenship. Um, but again, we work with so many lenders and we selected them that so we can always have a good range of options that you have. So for one, citizenship, where you're from, doesn't matter. Um, if it is a, an issue, if you're, you have a different citizenship and you're already a, a property owner, and no, I mean, uh, they won't just take away your property because you have a certain, uh, um, so no, uh, there's no, no risk there. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Andrea, if we leave the Netherlands and you still own a property, the difference in the property tax is quite big, correct? The, the yeah that depends how much you have uh, you paid already uh the one uh, that is paid early i believe uh, i read it's 0.04 percent when you are resident and 1.2 percent when you are non-resident of the value of the property i'm not sure we quite understand the question uh, yeah that's 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 different be, uh, because uh, no it doesn't matter if you're a citizen uh, it matters how you use uh, the property so um uh, if you own the property as your residential uh, uh, property, then um, you pay uh, a 0.04% on the GWZ value, just be your, the property owner. Um, that's a completely different when um, you're an investor, because then it will be considered as an asset that you have. And then to be quite technical, it will, drop, uh, will come into a different um, tax box, a di different tax range. You have three boxes it's called one is income tax two is more investments uh, like uh, uh, on the stock market and three is more like assets that you have like savings and property for instance so then uh, it will be considered as such so then you have to pay a higher percentage on the owning the property that is quite specific but that only uh, applies on when you uh, are either a resident or an investor Okay, thank you. Um, let me see. Oh, she, uh, Andrea just put it something else uh, regarding the question. I mentioned the scenario when you buy the property and, and, and first live in for the two or three years and then decide to leave the country. Yeah, so if you leave the country, then automatically you're not a resident anymore. Um, so then you'll be an investor. So therefore, so that's the reason why then your tax that you have to pay will be higher, not because uh, you, you are not a Dutch resident, uh, not, not a Dutch citizen, but it really depends on how you use the property. So that's the, the difference in tax uh, consideration. I have a question from Elena Kudriashova. Uh, um, thank you for the presentation. Just to clarify, what is the minimum time to live and work in the Netherlands in order to apply for the mortgage? Uh, our work contract is for one year, but we would like to consider buying properly early. Um, so it kind of depends on what lender we go with. Some banks are a bit more conservative and they like you to live in the, pro in the Netherlands for at least two years, for instance, others, others say six months, two months, but there are also sufficient lenders that need zero days as long as you have a contract of employment um, uh, or a with potentially a declaration of intent, as we discussed before. Uh, most important thing is that you don't, uh, that you're not in your probation period then. But further up uh, for, for the rest, it's, uh, it's perfectly fine uh, to secure a mortgage. Uh, the moment that you move into the Netherlands, again, two things, um, BSN, so it does show a security number and the contract of employment and you're good. Thank you. Uh, so she said, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, a question from Raul, I guess uh, we, uh, we need your help now, Ludo. Hi there, thanks for the, this relevant webinar. I wanted to ask, are there any basic requirements to being able to get a mortgage like say annual salary limits, not having a student loan before it, oh, sorry for, uh, for you, uh, um, um, not having a student loan before? Um, no, yeah, no, there's no minimum uh, income requirement. The, the thing is that the more you earn, the higher the mortgage will be. So if you uh, have an income of 5,000 euros a year, uh, to be perfectly honest, then your mortgage will, won't be that high and you might be able to borrow 20,000 euros. And then it's really hard to find a property for 20,000 euros. So that's kind of the, the balance to find there. So the more you earn, the higher the mortgage will be. 
Um, but no, it's, it really depends on your specific situation and what you can borrow then and what you want, what your uh, preferences are as well. Uh, it's tricky to buy a million uh, million euro property with an income of 20,000 euros a year. That's basically kind of how it works. Okay. Um, how uh, From host, how do, uh, do you transfer funds from a Canadian bank account to Dutch account after obtaining residence in the Netherlands? What are the costs and are uh, in there are taxes? I guess that's something that have to be, uh, uh, we have to look a bit uh, 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 more. And of course, yeah, it is possible to transfer uh, the funds, right? There's, so, no, uh, there's no taxes there. Uh, again, uh, as Ludo already mentioned, uh, the tax authorities are very happy if money comes into the Netherlands. Uh, if it's a sufficient, uh, a significant amount, then um, maybe they'll just do a double check where it comes from. That's something that a bank might do anyway uh, to just ask you what the history is of the last six months. Um, but no, you can uh, easily transfer, especially in this day and age, it's a couple of clicks away and you can transfer the money to, to the Netherlands. Uh, no taxes are implied. No. Thank you. I have a few questions in the chat. Let me see. Are investments, this is from Ishan, I hope it's correct. Are investment mortgage rates higher than residential? Yes, uh, about, uh, depending on the lender again, about one to one and a half percent. Okay, there we go, thank you. Um, we have a question for you, Ludo, at, from uh, Sean Kini, I guess. At what point in the process the 10% deposit made uh, as the offer at the application of Morgan or at the contract? We already talked a little bit, but I guess it's nice for you to clarify it. Yeah, sure. Um, maybe yeah. it's easier if I go back. Oh, yes, that's perfect. So, um, let me see. Um, right here. So, five weeks after the technically, uh, typically five weeks after the purchase agreement has been signed or one week after the mortgage application is approved. Um, so you, know, you do this uh, at a rather late stage when you've signed the purchase agreement already and you've applied for the mortgage and have received either rejection or approval from the mortgage. Um, okay, thank you. I have a question from Angela, uh, also for you, Ludo. Um, how many people or family members can be registered in my house? It's a good question. Um, it depends a little bit or differs a little bit per municipality, but nine out of 10 times they speak of one household. There's no limit or there's no legal limit on it uh, because there's also no legal limit on how many kids you can have. And let's say you have 10 children that technically speak, they can all live with you. Um, but what, yeah, they, they say one household. Um, and sometimes if you want, for example, your grandmother to live with you or things like that, uh, that also shouldn't be a problem, but it's not the idea that you um, house best um, yeah, two or three families in your house, um, because that, that's just not, uh, not realistic. But uh, check with your municipality what they say about, uh, about these specifics. Great, thank you. Um, I have, um, I already answered that one. Um, how will the mortgage be modified uh, from Agustin Gonçalves Borrega? How will the mortgage be modified if you, uh, you change from residential to invested mortgage? Um, yeah, there's, n there's not a significant difference. I mean, still, you, it works the same way as a regular mortgage. You repay and, and you pay interest. Uh, just the thing is that the interest rate will be higher. Uh, there's no tax benefit over the interest that you pay. Uh, that only applies on a residential mortgage. Um, and one other thing is, as mentioned before, is that um, a regular mortgage, a residential mortgage, the maximum that you can take out, um, your maximum mortgage will be based on two factors, by the way. One is your income, obviously, and the other one is the property value. So you cannot borrow more than the property value. With a residential mortgage, that property value is 100% of the property value. With an investment mortgage, it works a bit differently. It's a bit technical, and I can discuss that in, in a personal call later on, but essentially it kind of boils down to that you're able to secure a mortgage, an investment mortgage of about 60 to 70% of the property value. Uh, just because banks see that more of a risk factor, so they want to uh, calculate that risk and say, okay, we secure a mortgage of about 70% of the property value. Um, so that's the main thing that you have to consider, that you have to cover that 30% remaining uh, between the 70 and 100 percent value that that has to has to come out of your personal savings or you might already have repaid the mortgage to a certain extent 
So that's basically it. Interest rate goes up, no tax benefit. Um, the repayment goes exactly the same way. And the only thing is that you might have to input more of your personal savings. Great, thank you. I have a question from Raul. Um, thanks for this relevant webinar. Thank you for being here. Uh, I want to try to- we, uh, I think we answered this question. Yes, oh, from the salary uh, limits, uh, not have that one, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I think that was in the Q&A as well already. Oh, okay, yeah, so sorry then. Yeah, I saw that two times, indeed. Um, then I have a, a question from Angela. Can I buy an apartment if I'm abroad and I'm a foreign, but my kids stay there, 19 and 20 year olds, as students? Um, you can buy a property still, that's no problem, but then I expect that you want to have a mortgage as well. Um, and then, no, you have to be, uh, uh, you have to live, either you have to have a Dutch passport, or you have to live in the Netherlands yourself, have a BSN, a Dutch social security number to be able to do that. What you could do, if you have savings available that you want to use for that, you could also, uh, if your uh, children have uh, just a part-time job, uh, we base the mortgage on that, and then you help them financially. But then that means that you cannot be the official owner of the property, your kids will be the official owner. And it could be that that's not necessarily a game that you have there. Okay. Thank you. And I guess we have the last question uh, um, uh, for you, Ludo. Can you elaborate on ground taxes issues? I heard that some apartments uh, might have to pay ground taxes to a third party, even though you bought the property. That's from Augustin Gonçalves Borrega. Thank you. Um, good question. Uh, it is actually not a, a tax, but is a, a lease. Um, it's called ground lease. Something that we see a lot in Amsterdam, but a few other municipalities have areas where they charge ground fees as well. How you should see this, um, you are leasing the ground from a third party. 99.9% .9 is from the municipality that you bought the property in. Um, you're leasing the ground to have your property on that ground. Um, the idea way, way back when ground lease started was to make properties more affordable to uh, instead of buying also the ground, you just bought the property and then you would pay a yearly amount for the ground. So instead of paying 100,000 euros for the ground as well, for the five years that you live in the property, you pay a small amount per year to have your property on that ground. Um, well, nowadays, unfortunately, properties that are on ground lease or properties that are on ground that is owned by the property owner as well, don't differ in, um, um, in, in value that much. Um, but indeed, what it is, is you're paying a amount to the municipality to have your property on the ground. That is pretty much what it comes down to. Um, it has impact on a few things. Um, most importantly, the mortgage cap. Um, so it might be that you have to pay a thousand euros per year to the municipality to have your property on the ground. How the bank sees it is you cannot use that thousand euros per year to pay to the bank and therefore your mortgage cap for this property might go down. Um, good to keep in mind though, even though the ground is technically speaking not owned but it is in, in lease, um, the ground lease or the, the ground owner the municipality cannot kick you out of the uh, property or cannot uh, tell you to remove your property from the ground uh, when they want to do something else with it. The only thing they can do is send you an invoice every year and make sure you pay. Ground lease terms last typically around 50 to 100 years. Now we see a lot of municipalities coming up with a perpetual time period as well. In other words, an everlasting time period uh, where they offer you uh, sometimes a discounted amount to fix the rate for the ground lease for the rest of time, plus inflation indexation. Um, so something to keep in mind. If you find a property on ground lease doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. It might also be the case where the current owner already paid off all the ground lease payments for the current ground lease term. Yeah, then you can technically see it as a um, uh, own ground situation. Um, but always good to flag and have a chat with your financial advisor, with Robin, to see um, if there are any impacts on your, your mortgage cap. But it doesn't have to be a big issue. You just see it as an extra uh, payment that you need to make every year. Okay, then I guess that answered our, our, our questions. Thank you so much. Perfect, cool. Well, thank you very much, uh, Giovanna, for, for arranging the Q&A. It was very valuable. Um, if there are any unanswered questions or anything that pops up after this webinar, um, you'll find two links. One here that goes directly to uh, the website of Expert Housing Network. And we also have a QR code over here if you want to have a chat with Robin or with one of the uh, colleagues of Robin. 
Um, and then for now, I would like to thank you all. Thank you, Robin, for being my right hand when it comes to mortgage uh, mortgages. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for hosting. You're very, very welcome. And then I hope to speak to all of you soon.